Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. In the early videos of this series, I will often be doing a lot of background, so please bear with us. Kuma, Kuma, we've discussed this. We don't mean that kind of bear, okay? We'll talk later. Come on. <sighs> okay, so, no. so where was I? Ah, today I am talking about locomotive types and specifically about types of steam locomotives. Now I want to say up front that this will be a broad overview and I will not go into a great deal of detail on any particular locomotive. There are three general categories of locomotives, steam, electric, and all types of internal combustion engines such as diesel. In this episode we will look at steam engines and how they are identified. In the earliest days of locomotives there were so few that using its name was all one needed. One might say where the locomotive was located, like at such and such colliery, or the name of the engineer that built it. And in the early 19th century, many tramways, wagonways that were becoming railways, and other places had just one locomotive, so identifying which locomotive was a, a minor matter. But this was soon to change. Soon there were distinct types of locomotives, such as a Blinkensop locomotive or a Stevenson type. This did help early inventors with publicity, but soon there were many different types. Often the name of the first of a design became the type, thus rocket, and ones that were similar were called rockets. For the most part, throughout the 19th century, this was the way one described locomotives, by name. And as I said, often the name came from the first locomotive of its type. So let's look at a few more of the class names of locomotives. Locomotion. This locomotive inspired many others of similar layout. Rocket had one of the most distinct layouts and is still very easy to recognize. And while this style did not see that many years of service, it made such a splash that it will be remembered for a long time. In 1830 came the Planet. This became a type name for a large number of locomotives of the period. The variety of types built in this period is amazing, and while many of the early locomotives shipped from Britain to the Americas were of older designs, one of them, the John Bull, was very state-of-the-art. Once in the New World, the addition of its front pilot wheels changed its look substantially and started a whole new way of building locomotives. With the addition of leading and trailing wheel sets on newer locomotives, the variety of locomotives expanded greatly. Another locomotive with extra wheels and a notable name is the Patentee. This six-wheel type locomotive became one of the more common types across Europe. I'm going to look at some of the more common names and types, mostly known in North America. These names were easily recognized across many railroads and a fair bit of the New World. So I've already mentioned Locomotion, Rocket, Planet, John Bull, and Patentee. The Jervis type became one of the most common in the New World for years to come. Later, it was surpassed by the American or Canadian type. This locomotive reigned supreme for a long time. The Ten-Wheeler was the able successor to the American-Canadian type. Next, we look at a whole line of newer locomotives like Columbia and the Mogul type, most often used as freight engines. Then comes the Atlantic, and the Reading Jubilee types, known for their speed. Locomotives became bigger and bigger. Prairie, Consolidation, and Pacific, all known for pure pulling power. The Hudson design became the layout for many of the fastest of all steam engines. Heavy locomotives like the Mountain and Mastodon types for long and heavy goods trains followed. Some, like the Mikado, were built for a specific reason or place and became well known for their overall usefulness. 
Still, the steam locomotive seemed to have no limit on its size. Now comes the Berkshire, the Northern, also known as the Niagara, as well as the Decapods. Now, as I go through this list, do realize that some of these locomotives were designed at similar times by different manufacturers or railroads. For even heavier trains, there were engines like the Santa Fe type. You might guess which railway developed that one. Others, like the Overland and Texas type, as well as the Centipede and Union Pacific types were designed for big power. And just because it is so large, we have included the Soviet class AA-20. This is big. Speed has always had its champions, like the Pennsylvania T1, which looks fast even when sitting still. By the way, there is a very nice picture of this locomotive in the First Class Passenger Lounge at Amtrak's Chicago Union Station. As there were so many innovations and changes in design, some way of describing them would be useful. Even after other conventions of designation came along, some names stand out throughout history. Names like Allegheny and Cab Ahead the heavy locomotive type championed by the Southern Pacific. The large and powerful Malay, although properly this name referred to an entire family of articulated steam locomotives that used compound and steam, and Yellowstone, the more than legendary Challenger, and the colossal Big Boy, Union Pacific's greatest steam locomotive. There are also the poor and almost forgotten switchers and helpers. These had no grand names, but they did their jobs. At the beginning of the 20th century, there had been many editorials in the American Engineer and Railroad Journal about how to better classify locomotives. In 1906, a classification method for steam locomotives devised by Frederick Methven White was published in a handbook for railway industry workers. The white system, or white notation, quickly became the way steam locomotives were designated. The system is really very simple. All one needs to do is count the number of leading wheels, then the number of driving wheels, and then the number of trailing wheels. There are a few small variations, but for the most part, it is pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's look over our locomotive diagrams again, now with the white notations. This is based on counting the number of wheels of the locomotive, further broken down by what those wheels do. The first number is the number of leading wheels, those ahead of the main drive wheels. Leading wheels help steer a locomotive through curves, and trailing wheels allow for much longer boilers. This is John Bull, a very early locomotive in America, built by Robert Stevenson and Company of Newcastle, England. The locomotive had troubles with almost any curve. This problem led to one of the New World's great innovations. A leading pair of wheels were added to help steer the locomotive around curves. Why was this? Well, it is often thought that early American track was not laid all that well, unlike the rails back in Britain, or it may be that Americans had laid their track with a bit tighter curves. Whatever the reason, the new leading truck sure helped the locomotives stay on track. The second number is the number of driving wheels, that is, the wheels that actually propel the locomotive. In most steam locomotives, one or more pair of wheels are connected by a driving rod on each side of the locomotive. The third number is the trailing wheels behind the drive wheels. Trailing wheels help support the weight of the locomotive. These trailing wheels also help in allowing for longer boilers and thus more powerful locomotives. So the Pacific, for example, has four leading wheels, then six main driving wheels, 
then finally the two trailing wheels, and thus the Pacific is designated as a 462. Sometimes there are extra numbers for when there are more than one set of main drive wheels. This is the way the white system works for special arrangements like this. Four leading wheels, then eight drive wheels, then eight more drive wheels, and finally four trailing wheels. Four, eight, eight, four. The famous Union Pacific Big Boy. There are even a small number of cases where there are more main driving wheels such as the triplex or four, eight, 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 four. However, more is not always better. Let's look to the French. The system the French use is almost the same as the white, but cut in half. In the French system, instead of counting the wheels, you count the axles. So in the white system, where you have a 4, 4, 0, oh, in French, it would be a dieu, dieu, zero. In the future, we will look at other classification methods used mostly for electric and other locomotives. We hope you've enjoyed our look at counting locomotive wheels. And as always, we'll see you on the train, whatever the wheel arrangement.